nature to learn from it and to apply it for uh, the problems, uh, the uh, or societal problems, engineering problems, etc. Um, so let's start with the, the description definition of uh, biomimetics. Um, biomimetics is uh, this uh, definition is taken from uh, a dictionary. It's a study of uh, formation, structure, or function of biologically produced uh, substances and materials, and also uh, mechanisms and processes, and to use it uh, in engineering and science to replicate using engineering tools, uh, scientific tools. Uh, a similar description is given also in, in uh, Wikipedia, emulation of models, systems, elements, and also etymological uh, uh, root of the, the words uh, biomimetics comes from bio life and uh, mimesis is imitation uh, in Greek. Um, it's not just uh, a, a simple uh, method, but it has become almost a science uh, and it now has even uh, its own scientific journal, Bioinspiration and Biomimetics. Um, if you want to look into what other topics are covered in this broad field, you may want to check this uh, journal. Uh, if you are in a university or any other uh, educational institution, you may have access uh, through your library. And I would strongly recommend you to look at at least the topics and to understand what is covered by uh, biomimetics and what may be covered. You, you can uh, you may be, get inspired. Uh, so I will start with uh, a very uh, interesting uh, example of bioengineering. Uh, uh, when I say bioengineering, there is also a bioengineering topic. I'm not referring to that, but uh, engineers in, in nature. So uh, this is the uh, most one of the most interesting engineers in nature. Uh, do you know what it is? It's, it's, yeah, it's it's a termite uh, building. Uh, uh, it's home, a home for his big, big, big family. Uh, those are called mound building termites. They typically live in very hot environments, Australia, Africa, and uh, they, despite their this tiny size, this picture gives uh, you an idea how small they are. Yet they can build uh, monumental buildings uh, in for their size. Uh, the, the, those mounds can reach up to uh, 30 feet high and uh, 100 feet uh, diameter. So uh, it's th those are, uh, for their size, uh, monumental. But even more interestingly, uh, they not only built these wonderful structures, they also, they're good farmers. They cultivate fungi in their mounds. So you know they they uh, they are farmers. And they have farms in in those mounds. Um, but despite the hot climate, uh, for to live comfortably and also to be able to cultivate uh, fungi, they need to keep the temperature at a certain level, uh, even in this dry uh, environment. So they developed. They are mastered in the science of so-called passive cooling while designing, building their uh, homes, uh, mounds, and uh, to, uh, uh, to set to stabilize the temperature within those uh, homes. Uh, when you look at those uh, mounds, although they look simple structures, um, they have some special uh, you know, features. The materials, uh, material is feature, uh, 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 something special uh, with high uh, heat capacity. They, they have pores, so the entire home, the mount, can actually breathe, uh, exhale, inhale, uh, as we'll talk about. It has chimneys uh, for ventilation. So when the temperature is very hot outside, uh, inside where their nest is, the temperature is quite comfortable for living and also for cultivating fungi. Uh, still, there, the exact uh, working mechanism is not well known, but there are models, uh, there are particular two models that um, 
are speculated or thought that synergistically work to provide this comfortable temperature. Uh, one is called thermosiphon model. In this model, the hot, warm air produced by the uh, uh, termites goes up, as you would know, uh, hot air goes up, right, because it gets less dense, etc., uh, through those red arrows. And when it reaches to a certain height, uh, to, it's combined with the uh, water vapor humidity. It becomes denser and also gets cooler uh, through the uh, interaction with those um, spiky outside uh, uh, structures. It's very much like a radiator, behave like a radiator uh, with the high surface area. So it cools down, mixed with uh, moisture, and it goes down. Um, another model related to chimneys, when the wind flows, um, it blows that it, it produces some sort of suction effect. It's called stacking effect. So it kind of sucks the hot air upward and uh, the other chimneys closer to the ground or openings, ventilation holes, would feed the cool air uh, inside. This also takes advantage of the temperature difference between uh, the nighttime and the daytime. So in the nighttime, the temperature cools down this, uh, and uh, this coolness is stored in the larger base um, and keep cool early or hours of during the day. So it's an excellent design by any means and uh, for passive cooling. Now, how it's influenced or inspired uh, uh, building structures. Uh, in 1991, uh, a group of investors wanted to build a mall and office space in Harare, uh, Zimbabwe. Obviously Zimbabwe is in Africa, very dry environment, very hot. But they didn't want to spend a lot of uh, you know, some money for the uh, air conditioning. So they contacted with this uh, gentleman, Mick Pierce, uh, to design the building. And he looked into the uh, termites mounds and designed this building, uh, this building uh, at the kind of uh, uh, background. Uh, it's called, I think, North, uh, I forget the North Gates uh, Center. So it's the, it was one of the first uh, uh, of its type, taking full advantage of passive cooling. He applied almost everything uh, scientists learned from termites. The building has high, uh, built with the um, high heat capacity material that can store coolness during the nighttime. So, um, and it takes a lot of energy to heat uh, the material so that it uh, heats up very slowly during the daytime. It has spiky structures on the uh, facade, so it helps radiating the heat, but reduces the heat and light going into the building to heat it up. Um, it has chimneys during the night uh, time when the temperature is colder. The cold uh, air is uh, uh, fanned into the uh, building uh, using fans and circulated between the floors. So keep it cool. And when it gets uh, warmer by the time, it just goes through the chimneys out. Um, so it's perfect imitation of the termite mount, of course, a uh, man-made uh, uh, structure. And it provided a substantial energy saving. It uses only 10% of the energy needed by similar conventionally cooled buildings like air conditioning. So it's a fascinating uh, imitation of what we learn from the nature and actually what we learn from insects that you wouldn't expect uh, them to be uh, such a great engineers. That is actually um, really interesting. Do you know if any countries have taken any initiative on applying this imitation to like on, on their buildings regularly to decrease, I don't know, the amount, you know, the people who live in those buildings have to pay for like their AC condition, mm -hmm. for example. I'm not aware of any particular initiative, but uh, after this building, uh, it's been applied and it actually it's been uh, even further developed and applied to many other buildings. But 
any if there is any particular initiative i'm not aware of that again it's practice uh, mostly in uh, the realm of uh, civil engineering it's not really my field but uh what I uh, read that uh, it's applied to other buildings as well with the even more advanced version of this approach. But certainly it's a very helpful, efficient approach for sustainability. And I think it should be widely implemented at, uh, as, as you, you know, rightfully uh, recognized. It should be. Um, now we uh, changed another field uh, closer to my field on uh, optics and photonics. So uh, I'm sure you have seen those beautiful colors in nature. Uh, this is uh, 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 peacock tail feathers, so beautiful, so shiny, and butterflies. And this is the most intense blue color in the uh, in the world. It's uh, in the nature, Polia condestana berries, some sort of special blueberries. But what is interesting about all this colorful or so beautiful colors is that they do not use any paint, right? Typically, when you want to color something, you use paints, pigments in, in uh, other biological uh, systems, our skin, you know, our eyes, etc., hair, um, also use uh, color uh, uh, paints, we call them pigments that provides color. But here in those structures, and we'll see uh, some more, they do not have actual color uh, producing pigments or paints, if you simplify it. It's called structural coloration. So the structures at the very small scale produces those colors. Before uh, going into details, um, I will give you a primer about light waves. As you would know, light is an electromagnetic wave. Uh, different frequencies correspond to different colors as we perceive. Um, and uh, all, just like all other waves, electromagnetic waves also interview and interfere with each other when they meet. What does it mean? Uh, if you have such waves, right, this is one wave, one is the, the top, one is stationary. The second one the, uh, at the middle uh, flows or uh, moves uh, to the right hand side. And when two, uh, you know, this is a maxima, this is a minima, when two maxima uh, coincides when they are at the same place, the amplitude of the uh, uh, the wave, total wave, I would say, the uh, resultant wave, increases. But when a maxima coincides with a minima, they interfere uh, so-called destructively, and we get a zero amplitude. We don't have any energy or anything at all. So it's this process called uh, uh, interference. If you have... Uh, if, the zero amplitude, it's destructive. And if you have uh, enhanced amplitude, it's constructive interference. So this is sorry. about two waves. No, I'm sorry. I was going to ask if the interference is constructive, do, is the color that's vibrated a lot, uh, is it more vibrant? Or does no, the it, it, or well, like, you, are there different, do the waves impact, uh, impact like the different colors? No, uh, yeah. the, the, the color is related to the frequency or here wavelength, I would say. The, what is the distance between those two maxima, let's say? Um, this, this represents the color. But yes, if you have higher amplitude, you would see that color uh, more prominently, right? Um, so, um, and if you don't have anything, it means you don't see that color at all. It, when it's completely distractive, you don't see that color. So when... Uh, now, this is one thing, the first step. The second thing is when a wave hits to a surface and it's reflected back, the maxima and minima change their place. So it's called a phase change. And um, depending on this phase change, you may get a destructive interference at the surface, okay? Because of, you know, the maxima becomes minima, minima becomes maxima, they may interfere. And if you put such a, um, you know, if you have two layers, or if you have one layer on a surface, this layer will also contribute to phase difference, uh, depending on its uh, refractive index and the thickness. You may remember those things probably high school physics. When the light comes in, um, some of it 
uh, will be reflected from the first layer. If you have multiple layers of uh, transparent materials, the, uh, the second part will go through this first in uh, film and will be reflected from the second boundary or interface and go here. Now, depending on the phase of those two wave at this place, co coinciding place, D and C, let's look at here. If they have one has maxima and one has minima, this way max has maxima at this point and this way has a minima at this point, they will have destructive interference. And if they both if they both have either maxima or minima, it will be constructive, so you will have higher amplitude. Now, why is it important? This um destructive and constructive interference will depend on the material here, this light blue colored material, thin film, its refractive index and its thickness. By changing this, I may be able to get destructive or constructive interference. If I get constructive, nothing will be reflected. And actually, that's how anti-reflective coatings would work. On your glasses, typically, you, if you order your, if you wear glasses and if you order, you, they will ask you if you want uh, anti-reflective coating. And if you uh, order it, they put such a thin film providing uh, destructive interference, so you will not get any reflection, nor light will be reflected, although some will be reflected. But the one that's reflected from here basically kills this one, nothing survives. And if this, of course, this is here, we consider only one specific wavelength. If you send different wavelengths and if you have different thicknesses, different colors will be reflected. Some will, be, will not be reflected because of the destructive interference. And a very good example of it that the those bubbles, salt bubbles, because they don't have a uniform thickness, they reflect and do not reflect certain colors because of this non-uniform thickness. And we see those beautiful colors. Okay. Now, if you make a very comp, this is a very simple example. You can make this very complex. You can put multiple layers. You can make this uh in in on a, a surface you can have part of it with this part of crystals controlling the uh, uh what colors will be reflected what colors are not reflected so i can select what colors will be reflected uh more brightly by simply adjusting the thickness and made maybe the material. And it's beautifully, beautifully used in the nature. This is a morpho butterfly. You see the color, it's so bright, so beautiful, but it doesn't have any paint to produce this color. It's completely structural coloring. If you look at it uh, uh, closely, you see those shapes, it still looks blue, but it's artificial color. Uh, it's not an optical microscope image. It's uh, a, a CM scan, electron microscope image. They do not produce color. It's artificially colored. Um, so this is a 100 micron. If you remember that one micron is one, mi one um, uh, thousandth of a millimeter. So it's 0.1 millimeter, this bar. So those are about 0.2 millimeter or so. Very, very small structures. Uh, and if you look at even closer, uh, using a CM, we see that uh, those undulations. Uh, so the color is produced because of the different uh, reflection of light from different parts of this microstructures. Other colors are uh, have destructive interference. Only the blue color has, uh, is allowed to be reflected back. No coloring. What color is reflected is selected because of the size of the structure and the material refractive index of the material. So it's it's so beautiful uh, to have such a beautiful you know uh, implementation of this uh, photonic principle. Let's send our morpho butterfly, and it found uh, an application uh, electrical engineering or photonic engineering a company. Qualcomm, probably you have heard of it. They are very big, especially in mobile devices. They invented so-called interferometric modulator display. So this display could be used on mobile devices. 
you, you know that in your uh, all your screens typically use LEDs, light emitting diodes, or sometimes lasers. They produce light, and then the light is selected through another filter, so we see different colors on the screen. But that takes a lot of energy because we produce light, and producing light is not uh, something very easy to a light emitting diode and complex mechanisms. But this doesn't have to have a light source. It takes advantage of the ambient light. Uh, it's reflected through mirrors. What's special about that is there are cavities behind the reflective surfaces, and this cavity, the thickness of this cavity, controls what colors are reflected back. So by controlling the spacing between the first layer and the second layer, precisely, you can select what color is reflected. You don't need an LED light emitting diode behind to produce color. You don't need a laser. The ambient light is enough, and the computer, the controlling circuit, simply selects this thickness, which controls the reflected light. And actually, it's implemented in this mobile device, uh, it's a pad, um, and you see, you know, beautiful reflection no no uh, light emitting device so it doesn't need as much en energy it saves a lot of energy so the better life will be longer if those devices are used again very beautiful uh, implementation of uh, what's uh, we see what we see in nature um another optics engineer do you know what this is do you know this guy oh, any yeah. idea <laughs> no i don't know the name of that actually yeah it's uh well, you know, uh, it's it's difficult to uh, recognize superheroes in the daytime. You have to sometimes look at them in the nighttime. So it's a firefly, obviously. <laughs> uh, it emits light, uh, magically emits light. Uh, the, I'm not going to details of how the light is produced. It's chemical process by itself is another miracle. Uh, but what's also interesting that um, the Extraction efficiency of this light is also quite well, quite good compared to uh, man-made, uh, let's say, LEDs, light emitting diodes. And it's very important. Now we all use light emitting diodes for illumination and for many applications, actually, or those small uh, lamps are typically LEDs, light emitted diodes. But when, the, when you create photons in those electrical small microelectronic devices, not all the created photons are uh, can be emitted. There are reflections uh, through the interfaces, so that reduces the efficiency, typically the extraction efficiency. And we need that efficiency because we want to be more sustainable. Uh, we want uh, more efficient uh, lighting devices everywhere. So uh, scientists look at that uh, beautiful uh, and creative uh, insect. Um, it has very efficient light extraction mechanism, not producing, but the ex produced light is uh, extracted very efficiently. And they found those so-called uh, factory roof structure for obvious reason, if you look at this, and this is the actual scanning electron microscope image. You see those, uh, you know, it's very much also roof, looks like roof tiles, but probably the cross section, it's something like this. And that results in higher efficiency. And uh, again, uh, scientists imitated and uh, took advantage of the similar, uh, similar structures at micro scale. They uh, added these similar structures after a lot of calculations and simulations. This is from a scientific paper. They give the details of those uh, simulations, etc. cetera. I skip those things. Um, and Ultimately, they added this layer, uh, AZ9245 is the name of uh, some sort of resist uh, or resin, uh, some sort of a polymer. It's added on a light emitting diode based gallium nitride. And by adding this, they increased the efficiency 68%. So it's a huge, huge increase. And that will, of course, reduce the energy consumption to have the same amount of light. So again, it's a beautiful implementation of uh, what we learn from uh, Firefly. Uh, let's continue with the uh, insects as well. Uh, another optical marvel is the uh, moth eye. Uh, insects have marvelous eyes. You see, you know, they have uh, <clears throat> those 
multiple eyes, uh, say called ometidia, ometidia, uh, uh, it's difficult to pronounce for me. Um, and if you look at them, they are made of those nanoscale structures, or pillars. Um, so this type of eye has a number of advantages. One adv advantage of because of the shape, this hemispherical, they can see almost uh, 360 around. You know, they can see back their back. You know, sometimes you want to, we wish we had, a, we could see our back, right? And they could see actually. Um, but also because of this, the uh, structure, this microstructure, the reflection is so minimal, they can see at very, very low light. And since there is no reflection, they do not reveal themselves uh, to their uh, editors. Okay. So it's not too difficult to understand why the reflection is so small. Imagine that light comes in. Light can be also considered as photons, particles. When they get in, they keep bouncing between those uh, pillars uh, instead of bouncing back easily, right? Especially this shape kind of trap the photons or lights, uh, light uh, waves. So the light will be bouncing back, you know, infinitely, perpetually between those. Of course, eventually it will be absorbed, but that reduces the reflection uh, and it increases the efficiency. So again, we could take advantage of this reduce reflection for many applications. You would like to have a very good efficiency for your photo detectors for any reasons, photo sensors. You want to reduce reflection for solar cells, right? You don't want any sunlight to be reflected. You want it to be absorbed, all the incident light. So that's, a, again, a very a good approach to reduce reflection for such applications. And um, for the first one, the first, adv first advantage that I uh, just explained, the hemispherical structure, which could provide 360, or for one of them, probably 180 degree uh, view field. And actually, uh, John Rogers group developed such a <coughs> mouth eye eyeball, uh, a digital camera, which could see almost 180 degrees. Um, so it's, uh, again, beautiful implementation. And for the second, uh, advantage, the reduced reflection, people managed to uh, produce such structures using different, many different techniques. And this is also a good uh, plot. It shows only uh, maybe 2% is reflected uh, in such structures. This is reflection, T is reflection percentage. Um, so they could be used for, again, many applications. This almost covers entire visible range, 400 to even infrared, um, so it could be used, um, well, not so much with starting from blue light, probably, uh, but it could be used for cameras, again, for solar light, for uh, to increase the efficiency of photovoltaics, etc. And another some, some somewhat cool application, uh, I don't know if you heard the darkest material in the world. Have you heard of something like that? Or have oh, you I seen the darkest material? I'm excited <laughs> to see what you, you cannot see, of course, since it's darkest material. And this is what it is, okay? Um, what you don't see here, this black area has the same shape of this mask, okay? But it's made of a material, the darkest material in the world. That's why we cannot see it. All the light falling onto this is absorbed. Nothing, almost nothing is reflected. I think 1% is reflected, only 1%. Again, uh, this, oh yeah, it's called Wanta Black, it's the commercial name. And it's made of similar structure, carbon nanotubes, uh, an array of forest of carbon nanotubes. Again, it's they are very similar to what just uh, I, I showed. Uh, when the light comes in, it cannot go back. It's, it's trapped between those dense uh, pillars, uh, very, very tiny pillars. Of course, it could be used for, again, many applications. And one cool application, uh, is that uh, they painted the BMW with this one. It became almost invisible, especially in the probably in the nighttime. Okay. Uh, a cool application. I don't know how useful it is, but it's it's at least it looks cool. Okay. Cool. <laughs> I can so another another question now is uh 
There what is, is I'm sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. I yeah. Now, uh, since we are moving in the uh, optical domain still, what's the smartest camera ever? That's the answer. I, I think the answer for this question is uh, quite uh, easy, right? Your eyes. Why would I call it smartest rather than, let's say, best camera? Because our eyes are so special, they do not just produce image, but also process the visual data at that point on eye, which reduces the uh, efficiency, I'm sorry, which reduces the uh, energy and processing required for brain and also for transduction. So uh, makes the, uh, the visual process much more efficient. What do I mean by that? Um, when the cell uh, produce an electric, electrical signal, they do not behave like a camera which takes uh, a frame as a picture. You know, when you uh, hit the uh, button of your camera or your cell phone, when it takes a picture, it either uses a, a mechanical shutter in all cameras or uh, some cameras or electronic shutters which reads the uh, values on the sensing pixels uh, and then captures the image. But that's a, that's a frame capturing. It reads all the uh, signals from all the pixels. And even if when you uh, record a video, same thing happens. Periodically reads the values of the pixels. Our eyes don't do that. They send signal, they process, only when something changes on those uh, uh, pixels, of course, the pixels correspond to uh, cells on our retina. So it's called event camera uh, or neuromorphic camera. Uh, it's an imitation of actual human eye. So in, in a camera, you know, when it captures, it captures all the frames. However, in our eye, it processes and only when something changes on, on signal, the light intensity or color changes, that signal is transferred to brain. So there is a process uh, happening in the camera it's, uh, eye itself, which corresponds to camera, which makes a smart camera. So that of course increases the computational efficiency. You don't have to send all the frames to brain or computation uh, center, computation unit. So that's, uh, a, a tremendous improvement in uh, image recognition uh, on or, or similar uh, applications. And How again, people... do you think the well? There's a chat from there's a question from the chat, and it's oh, asking yeah. how far have you come? Like how far do you think cameras have come to mimicking the human eye? Uh, I don't understand. How far? What? How far has the development of cameras come to perfectly? Well, not obviously perfectly, but mimicking the human eye. So like being able to- Well, it, it, this, this, well this is a very good question. Uh, I, I wanted to emphasize that actually probably at the end of this part, uh, very good. So it's a very timely question. Uh, it depends on what metric do you use to, to compare a human eye or a biological eye with uh, a camera. As you see in this uh, uh, table, cameras could be faster you can put even more pixels than human eye has. And, and currently human eye is more efficient in terms of power. But even in the future, we may develop very low uh, sensors and we can even beat human eye um, uh, in, in terms of power as well. But I and other <laughs> biological system that I will present, uh, the next will be brain, I believe. They are designed so well, considering all the factors. Engineers typically, when they when we design something, we have a primary design criteria. Either we want it to be um, very fast, let's say for camera, or very efficient, or <clears throat> very low power. And everything would be usually secondary. And also, oftentimes, those secondary things would be uh, uh, inconsistent with each other or uh, conflicting, okay? If you want to have low power, you have to sacrifice the performance typically. 
if you make it small or uh, you may need to uh, sacrifice reliability. So it's difficult to optimize for the entire uh, use space. But eyes or other biological systems are optimized for almost for everything, almost, including the uh, ecological system as well, uh, fitting to the best to the uh, environment they would live. So yes, the cameras can catch up, even beat eye on certain uh, metrics, but overall, eye will have its own optimized uh, uh, marble. Okay. Now, uh, moving forward, uh, just you know, uh, using as a segue from this computation at place uh, to brain-inspired computing. Our brain, also a marvelous computing machine. Uh, we, we have hundreds of uh, billion, hundred billion uh, about uh, uh, neurons and each connected to between 100 to 1,000 uh, other uh, neurons making synapses. <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's a marvelous uh, connectivity. And uh, uh, the electronic and typically digital systems right now have, are based on uh, transistors, which you could uh, either turn on and off to uh, encode ones and zeros of digital systems. And by putting them together, you can make logic gates and logic gates are combined to make uh, 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 computational units. One important uh, criteria in the conventional computation is that um, uh, memory and the uh, computation unit are considered to be different uh, parts. Uh, but now there is a, a, a research, a huge research, combining those two uh, in-memory computing. Um, it, this model is called one Newman computing architecture, where the uh, processing unit and the memory are different units. In brain, it's not different. I mean, the synapses, uh, uh, serve as memory and also uh, a computation unit uh, because of this uh, their structure. So uh, when we look at uh, when we compare this uh, one human architecture and the brain, <clears throat> it's also called neuromorphic architecture. Uh, we have let's say ten billion transistors or hundred billion transistor in a CPU. We have. Uh, uh, this should be 100 billion neurons, there's a typo here, and then trillion of synapses in brain, this massive connectivity allows, and also the uh, difference of computing uh, structure, allows massive parallel computing. We don't need to go sequential, like here uh, in a CPU, you feed the, uh, either data first, and then the instruction to apply on this data, but everything is done almost uh, um, sequentially. On the other hand, in our brain, everything's uh, happened, processed uh, um, massively parallel fashion. So uh, inspired by this architecture and method, there is a huge, huge research in brain-inspired computing, also called neuromorphic computing, uh, alternative uh, devices to typical transistor are developed, are being developed. Um, they are called memristors and different types of memristor devices to mimic how our uh, uh, neurons uh, uh, work or synapses work. Uh, I will not go into details. It's by itself, again, very, very uh, deep field. This compares the, uh, the power required for that. Our brain uses about 10 to 20 watts and Typical computer uses 100 watts and supercomputers in many ways like brain or in certain ways can catch up brain's capability requires a huge power uh, that's kind of even more than a wind turbine. So brain does a, uh, you know, a very impressive work for such a little, uh, using such a little uh, amount of energy uh, and uh, using a uh, marvelous architecture, uh, neuromorphic architecture. Now, moving in a different direction, another so beautiful and impressive uh, uh, aspect of biological systems is self-healing. Whenever you cut yourself, 
uh, in a day, in a couple of days, it heals itself. You have probably seen it several, several, several times. Uh, but it's not the case for other things. I'm sure you all cried over your broken toys, like I did, or my children uh, still is do are doing. Um, so even a Superman toy cannot heal itself. And probably you feel sad when you wreck your screen on, on your iPhone or uh, cell phone. And uh, same for cars. When you hit, they do not heal themselves, right? It would be wonderful if they could, uh, so we don't have to you know, uh, take them to a uh, repair shop. Imagine that your iPhone could fix its screen after uh, such a crash and you don't have to pay another hundred dollars or whatever, or you didn't, you know, you wouldn't have to re uh, re uh, replace it. So uh, what is the mechanism uh, in human or in biological systems? There is a, a massive vascular network uh, underneath of the skin, the first part of the skin, uh, layer of the skin, epidermis, it provides all the biological components to heal this cut. Uh, first, you know, the, the, the blood clot is formed there, then uh, other growth hormones, growth factors, I'm sorry, are, are uh, rushed to there to heal it. Uh, it's a very complex biological process, but they all provide it, all those uh, if you call it glues or healing agents are provided, uh, delivered by this massive uh, uh, vascular network. And in a couple of days, you have uh, uh, the same, you know, the uh, healed, uh, repaired uh, uh, skin. So why don't we do the same using our nanofabrication techniques? Indeed, uh, researchers, scientists develop something similar, a microvascular uh, uh, network in uh, a structure. So there are micro channels. They carry uh, a, a polymer that could heal, or uh, you know, kind of a glue. When uh, a crack happens, it simply glues back those uh, parts, and indeed it works. Okay, uh, those micro channels. This is again uh, a microscope image, and when the cracks happen, this is a. Uh, 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 picture, you see the uh, healing agent is released through those uh, artificial veins, if you call it, or microvascular structures, and heal the structure. So the structure is not broken. You can see the excess uh, agent. It could be probably easier to clean, uh, but at least it's not, uh, it's not shattered, right? So it worked. It may be expanded to uh, other applications, maybe in you know uh, mobile uh, device screens in the future. It's possible, so you don't have to worry about uh, you don't have to take uh, your device uh, to a repair shop if it becomes uh, available. Uh, another very interesting uh, thing in the nature that we see is uh, a camouflage. Okay. And particularly some animals, uh, cephalopods, this, um, I don't know if you have seen this video, please pay attention. Are you surprised or are you surprised as much as I am? Yeah, uh, I was not expecting Would, would you octopus. ever guess that there is a, a, an octopus here? Would you oh. ever guess? Oh. I don't think anyone would, right? So uh, cephalopods, you know, octopus, has this amazing, amazing capability of changing not only the color, but also the texture of its skin. But that's not the only amazing part. It also has a brain, in a way, distributed to entire, its entire body. So those cells along, you know, on, on uh, its skin decides what color what texture they need to arrange themselves to have the best camouflage. They don't need to communicate a central brain. So it's amazing nervous system. Of course, it's a, it presents an more enormous opportunities for many applications. Uh, and the, yeah. very recently, a couple of years ago in 2019, uh, Department of Defense 
uh, put a call. They periodically put calls for interesting research topics every year. Uh, they have several, several research programs. This one's particularly a multidisciplinary research program. And they listed this uh, in this call, bio-inspired high dimension control through uh, models of cephalopod distributed information processing. Basically, they wanted scientists and researchers to understand how how um, octopus brain or body work and how we can imitate it in for many applications. Is there any examples that you know of that have- This is a very new program. I'm not aware of any uh, output outcome of this research yet or in terms of uh, uh, application yet, but uh, there is uh, there are papers uh, as a result of this research um, explaining how it works. But there is no, as far as I know, you know, how they're tr still trying to understand how this nervous system work, um, octopus nervous system work. Are there but, any other animals that are included in this? Like, they, there, uh, there are. I mean, not not exactly the same. Uh, I mean, the same family, family, of course, you know, the uh, squid, et cetera. But there are some fishes uh, that uh, have similar capability adjusting their the texture of their skin. Not many, but there are some other uh, sea animals as well. That would be really cool if we could actually mimic that, especially for yeah. our military or anything else like that. It would be really yeah, cool. I mean, yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be military. Of course, military has uh, yeah. you know a lot of defense applications. But you can imagine that your your car changes its skin depending on the outside temperature or or nature. You know, while you're driving in a forest, it it looks like uh, I don't know. <laughs> A grassland or, or a, a tree and then if you drive yeah, it, it would be so cool i guess or your clothes even adjust to the environment just to save uh you know uh, to to make you more comfortable in terms of heat etc that would actually be so cool if we created a suit that could basically adjust itself and even its texture according to its environment and especially i think it would be really useful when it comes to research like being in yeah. areas with really high temperatures i don't know it's like if you can not only just like um, hide yourself or blend in, but also like in a way help your body um, yes, yeah, tolerate the true. temperature, that would be so right. Cool. Yeah, if, you know, you, you would be more comfortable, right? If if they just the uh, um, so I think this is probably the last one. I'm not sure, but this is uh, ATP synthase. Uh, now we're going into uh, very small scale um, for those who do not know much biology. I'm not a biologist uh, either, but uh, ATP synthase is, is uh, uh, a protein uh, catalyzed formation of uh, uh, synthesis of, from the name you can easily understand, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, using adenosine diphosphate and inorganic phosphate uh, as a phosphate and using protons, those uh, hydrogen ions, as fuel. Okay? So it's it's basically a molecular machine. If you look at that, uh, there are beautiful videos on YouTube. You could see that. But what's interesting is that there are in in our uh, mitochondria there is a, a <clears throat> proton um, concentration difference. So in in one part of the mitochondria uh, um, membrane, there are, there are other proteins which are not shown here. So. Uh, the uh, hydrogen uh, protons are carried from one side of the membrane to other side easily, so to produce some gradient. Electrically, it also corresponds the potential difference. You have more positive charge here, and less positive charge. So this is like negative part, and this is positive um, uh, terminal. So we have a, a gradient of uh, a chemical gradient as well as a potential difference. Now, this uh, positive chargers go through this. Um, Again, Marvel's machine, as they are attached, those uh, yellow dots, I believe, represents the hydrogen ions, the protons, forces to rotate this molecule, the protein, 100, 120 degrees. And it has, uh, uh, you know, uh, the total circles, of course, 360 degrees and 120. So it has three components, three parts. One part takes in uh, ADP adenosine diphosphate and one phosphate, then uh, hydrogen rotates another, hydrogen rotates another 120 degrees. Now it, they go into second room compartment, which forces them to uh, 
ADP and a phosphate to combine. Okay. They have to combine because of the molecular structure. And then it rotates another 120 degrees, and then they are released. Now it becomes ATP, which is the basic energy unit in all living organisms, most of living organisms. So it is released. So this is a magnificent, um, again, so marvelous. Uh, what does it remind you? When I when I look at this, it's 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 like a dynamo, right? It's it's a dynamo or or, or um, uh, electric generator. In electrical generator, we have a magnetic field, a typical generator. So something rotates this uh, coil in a magnetic field, and uh, when this coil rotates in a magnetic field, magnetic flux changes, mag changing magnetic flux forces a current, and that produces electricity. This is how we produce electricity in almost all cases. Uh, this rotation is provided either by wind or water, water, steam, could be anything, but this mechanism is basically the same. Of course, this is not exactly the same, but very similar. And of course, I think if we think maybe we can replicate this in again nanoscale to produce energy, kind of a combination of this, large scale uh, electric generator and extremely small scale uh, molecular level uh, ATP uh, style, okay? So I am not aware of any such technology yet, but I certainly it's it's, uh, it's very inspiring. And and the this molecule by itself, I think it's amazing. I mean, um, the way it works. Yeah, not only is it inspiring, but it just reminds you how amazing like humans are created in nature itself yes yes true yes yeah yeah so uh that concludes my presentation of this part again um uh i i believe you would agree with me if i say that nature is a great fascinating book full of inspiration for scientists and artists who read it or who know how to read it okay um so apart from that um as a university professor i would like to uh so just one minute about NSF uh, REU programs for those who are not aware of it. If you are in an undergrad, uh, in a college undergrad, uh, or will be an, uh, a college student soon, I would strongly recommend you to uh, explore NSF REU program and REU sites. REU means research experience for undergraduates. So um, there are two uh, types of REU uh, students. One is uh, for uh, implementation of a program. One is REU sites. Uh, universities apply NSF to create an, an REU site in, in their departments. Um, typically during the summertime, nine to 10 students are uh, given scholarship to involve with research for about nine months, uh, nine weeks or so during the summer. So it's paid internship, internship for research. You get paid, you uh, work on a very cool uh, research project, you gain experience, uh, you uh, form a network. Um, so I would strongly recommend you to find out there are uh, this site uh, for, for students. There is a search for an REU site. There's a database there. Depending on your interest, it covers all sorts of disciplines from mathematics to biological science, chemistry to electrical engineering or computer science, everything. Yeah, so sure. you can get paid during the summer, again, get experience for research, uh, get to know people and uh, they could help you with your uh, CV or reference letters in, in your future career. Um, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, and that will also help you if you are planning to go for higher education, uh, MS or PhD. And again, I would strongly recommend uh, all of you. That will help you to get into th those programs. And if you are interested in, uh, again, uh, especially for PhD, uh, if you're interested in, uh, uh, in PhD, uh, search for um, NSF uh, Graduate Fellowship. It's a very prestigious uh, fellowship program. Uh, it's very competitive. But if you go through RU programs, you will have better chance to get into, uh, to receive uh, NSF Graduate Fellowship. Uh, I would strongly recommend to start with REU, um, maybe, you know, a couple of summers, uh, 
and then apply for uh, GFRP, this uh, graduate fellowship. And, uh, you know, you will get a very good, uh, very uh, lucrative salary uh, during your PhD and freedom to work with anyone you want, very cool projects, and hopefully contribute to uh, science uh, in the future. Thank you. For okay, that, that concludes my presentation. I would like to answer uh, any, any question you may have. Thank you for the presentation. I'm sorry, uh, I wasn't as inter like interactive because I was so into like listening and just like uh, digesting all the information you gave us here in the slideshow. And thank you for informing us about NSF. I'm gonna check that out the second I get no, into it. No, please do, you know, please do, yeah. yeah. Um, well, as he talks at the end of our um, live discussion, we ask four questions. So our first mm -hmm. question is, what is your favorite color? Uh, I would say blue. I just this color you see much. <laughs> it's my favorite colors. <laughs> you know, when I saw you, I was like, I feel like his favorite color is gonna be blue because he has a blue shirt on as well. <laughs> and I got that right. Yeah, I, I really like. I have many of uh, these shirts, almost the same color, very similar uh, tones of those blue. Uh, some of them are given as gift uh, by my daughter. <laughs> she also likes, and she knows that I like this color. Yeah, blue is a nice. <laughs> Uh, our second question is, what are three books you would recommend? Okay, three books. Um, uh, it's difficult to you know, remember all the books. I, I would recommend, um, the if you are into science, one, one good science book that every student should read is uh, uh, A Brief History of Time by Hawkins. It's a very good introduction to understand the nature, the universe, actually. Mm -hmm. I would strongly recommend you. Uh, there are different versions of it. Uh, and, and but I would strongly recommend you uh, to read it. Um, I would I would remember some of the books that I kind of read uh, recently. Uh, one is Servant Leadership. Um, it's it's a philosophy developed by I think um, Robert Greenleaf some time ago. Then he turned into a, a an a, and um, a management approach. It's it's beautiful. There are books around that approach as well. I think there's also <clears throat> someone, uh, um, there's also servant leadership, uh, and another kind of a spin up the same idea, but a smaller book. It's also uh, another book that I read very recently is uh, Decisive. It's written by two, uh, two brothers. Um, last name is Hath, I think Cheap Hath, I, I forgot the, the other name, but Decisive is a very good book. Uh, to help you um, understand how people form their decisions and make a, a, a good decision, uh, or make good decisions more easily, I would say also. Oh, okay, I'm going to check those out. And you said that there are different versions of a brief introduction of time. Which version would you recommend? Um, I, I mean, there is a, even, uh, I forgot, the, the different versions, of, but there's, I think, even shorter or even briefer. So I, whatever the title I gave you is the original book. Uh -huh. uh, then there the are extended version of it, I believe, and the shortened version of it. Um, I, I think there's also even more brief. I, I forget the other parts, but the, the, the original one is the good one. I mean, uh, I didn't read all the versions. I am aware of, I've seen them, but the, the one I read is the original one. Oh, it's a very good starting starting book. To understand universe, uh, how universe you know came to existence. That's uh, it, it's explained so beautifully. Yeah. That's also you know we, we looked into a small part of it. You know biomimetics, biological uh, systems, but the universe itself also amazing. I mean, in the larger scale, if you think about all the galaxies and galaxy systems, etc., it's also uh, it's a very impressive. I uh, strongly recommend you to read it. Uh, our third question is three film movies you would recommend to our audience. Oh, <laughs> well, um, having young children, I usually <laughs> watch recently, you know, animation movies. <laughs> so I, I don't know. Um, uh, I, I say, talking about animation, I, I'm a big fan of Ghibli Studio movies as an adult. You know, I'm not ashamed about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love I love that uh, all, all the all the movies of uh, Ghibli Studios. Uh, so I I mean if if you haven't seen, uh, I would strongly recommend to see them. 
Uh, all, all of them, you know, uh, spirited away, uh, Ponyo, and, and I love them. I love the message. Um, uh, so, and uh, there's, um, uh, I, I, when I think about, you know, the first things in my mind, I like Truman Show. <laughs> Yeah. I don't. I think everyone everyone knows that. Um, my favorite. Oh, life is beautiful. Uh, it's about uh, you know World War Two. Uh, I think I like that movie too. I would recommend. Probably you have seen it or most people have seen it already. Wow. I'm gonna watch that. Yeah, yeah. Li life is beautiful. Uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, the the atrocities of the Second World War uh, through uh, the eyes of a child and uh, his father. I, I think it's it gives hope and how your perspective uh, changes how you see things. It's it's in if you look from that perspective, it's it's really good movie. I'm gonna watch that one out of the three you recommended. I haven't watched that one. I'm gonna check that one out. Thank you. And our fourth question is the really special one. What do you think about art? Like, what are your thoughts on it? Um, I, I love art. Again, I mean, I see what we are doing also some sort of art or some uh, kind of art. Uh, and actually, there are art contests of those um, uh, pictures of uh, nanostructures. I don't know if you've seen them. People um, fabricate beautiful features, uh, structures in extremely small scale, nanoscale, and uh, take their pictures using skin electron microscope, and then you know they they put them, and then th th there are contests for them. Uh, so I mean, what we are doing also related to art, uh, not just how they look visually, but also how they work. And uh, I think they science and art are very complementary each other because they uh, are they uh, they are part of our existence, right? Uh, as human beings, cognitive part to understand, and then our, um, we say, spiritual part that really appreciates that what we understand. So I think uh, in a way they are complementary each other, and uh, you, you would do better in either of them if you are familiar with the other one as well. If you know a little bit about science, I believe you can appreciate art better and you can be even better artist probably and, yeah. and vice versa. Thank you. Thank you for this amazing presentation and your recommendations. I will now be handing um, the speaker to Zeze. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Paula. While interacting and while watching the presentation, I felt like I learned a lot as a non-STEM student. So that was a very, very interesting topic. And I love how you ended with Seeing Nature is a very fascinating book. And that was awesome. And we will make sure to share all your recommendations on our social media. And thank you so much for accepting our invitation and joining oh, our Thank you um, for having me. Talks. Thank you for inviting <laughs> Thank you so much tonight. And Husna, you did a pleasure. great job at moderating. Thank you so much, Husna, for joining tonight as well. And thank you audience for tuning in and joining our eTalks episode tonight. We had a very awesome guest, an awesome topic, you know, a topic that most of us has never heard of, but now we know it. I think we can all appreciate that topic and maybe get interested and research about it. And tonight, thank you so much for tuning in and make sure to follow our social media accounts, which are linked down in the below. And let us know what you thought about tonight's episode. Have a beautiful day, night, evening, and see y'all next week.